Chapter 16 of Matthew, we are past the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus had been interacting predominantly with Gentiles for, for the second part of uh, chapter 15. Uh, so we, we completed all of that. And now, in 16, the, the, the unholy alliance here, we could call them. The Pharisees and the Sadducees come together. These two groups had nothing in common with one another other than they were considered Jewish leadership. They didn't like each other. They didn't believe the same thing. You know, you would think that if you're making up a governing body within a, a, a nation, uh, to the extent that Rome would allow it, that you would have to have some kind of an agreement. But they, they didn't get along any better than our Congress gets along right now. So, um, you know. One, the Pharisees were the legalists. They were the ones the scribes came from. They were the ones that that copied all of the scriptures, which would be the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, the, the Proverbs, all of that. They copied all of that. They're the ones that were charged with doing that and keeping it and very strictly copying it so that we have, even today, scrolls that are hundreds of years apart from one another and yet are exactly the same. That's the kind of detailed work that they did. Very thankful for that. But they also added to it the traditions of men. Remember when we talked about that, Jesus addressed that uh, when they accused the disciples of Jesus of not washing before they ate. And it wasn't a hygiene thing. It was a, it was a ceremonial washing of the hands. And they felt that they were defiled because they didn't carry on that tradition of the elders. But Jesus said his answer to that was it's not what's going into the mouth of a person it's not what you're eating if you haven't ceremonially washed yourself and then you eat that doesn't defile you what defiles you is what comes out of your mouth because out of the mouth speaks the abundance of the heart what you're thinking what you believe comes out of your mouth sooner or later and it's that that is offensive it's that that is defiling of a person not not what you take in the Sadducees, on the other hand, didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in anything spiritual. They pretty much restricted themselves to the first five books of Moses, and that's it. They didn't, they didn't follow the prophets. It's hard to believe that you could look at Exodus and say there was nothing supernatural about worshiping God. I mean, you know, right out of the box, you've got the plagues, you've got the parting of the Red Sea, you've got, you got everything that happened by... God working through Moses, and but they discredited all of that, or they they denied all of that. No angels, didn't believe in the angels, none of that. No miracles, anything that you can't explain, they just dismissed. Now, both of those mindsets are alive and well in the church today. And we were, we were warned by Paul and by Peter and the others that these things were coming. Paul warned the church at Ephesus about you know how thankful he was for their faithfulness, but he knew, he knew in his heart that there were going to be wolves that were going to show up from among themselves that were going to begin to rip and tear at the sheep of that church. And so it is today. We, we are caught up in tradition and ceremony, and it's, it's all of that added to God's word. And we dismiss the miracles. We dismiss the working of the Holy Spirit. We dismiss even the resurrection. We understand that there are seminaries in this country that call themselves Christian seminaries that even teach there's no second coming of Jesus. How do you, how do you, I mean, especially with today, we're going to get to that. He's going to tell his disciples. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. He's going to die. But he's coming. He's going to raise from the dead on the third day. When he leaves, after that moment, after that, that, that event, and he walks with him for another 40 days, at the ascension, he says, I'm coming back. At the, at the, the Last Supper, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you can also be. In my Father's house, there'll be many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would tell you. So if anybody ever tells you, those things are just 
good principles. Those are just Bible stories. There's no second coming of Jesus. There's no, there's no hell. We've already seen Jesus speak of hell. Those things are real. If, if we can't trust what Jesus said, then how do we trust him with our eternity? How do we trust him with anything? He wasn't just a good teacher that gets us through this life and then we pass on to, to nothing. There are warnings throughout the Bible. Deuteronomy warns of not adding to or taking away from God's word. The Proverbs talk about it. The book of Revelation, very adamant about you don't add to or take away from this book and the prophecies of this book. If you add to them, I'm going to add to you, I'll add to that person the plagues that are coming. If you take away from the prophecies of this book, I'm going to take your name. Your name will not be in the Lamb's book of life. You can't mess with God's word and think that you're in. You can't. The Mormons have added a whole other book that they call Scripture to the Bible. And if you corner them on it, and they knock on your door and insist, and if you feel like letting them in, you can ask them, is this not? Take your, your Bible. Is this not God's word beginning to end? They'll tell you, yeah. And you can take their Book of Mormon and say, then why do you need this? Well, because that's God's word too. Yeah, but there's things in here that contradict this. Well, God can change his mind. Uh, but this says he can't and that he won't. How do you reckon that? Well, he's God. He can do it. If he can change his mind, then he doesn't have to hold to that either. That's a lot of problems with that. They've added to it. Jehovah's Witnesses who also knock on our door. And listen. Listen. You don't have to listen to those people. But you're never going to win them over if you're rude to them either. You're never going to get them to look and see the light if you don't be nice and show them the love of God. And if anything, it ought to convict some of us about their intensity and their, their drive to get what they believe is the truth out. But that's not enough. What they're doing and their devotion to what they believe is still a devotion to a lie. And they've taken the Bible and they've cut out verses and whole passages. And they've taken away from the word of God to suit their needs. But we don't have to focus on them. In, and I've already mentioned seminaries in the, in the area of, of, of education. We're taking away from God's word. And it's the same question. It's the same question. Did the Bible really say that? Does God really mean this when he says this? Nothing's changed. That is the first question, I believe, that, that Satan asked Eve in the Bible, or in, in the garden. Is that really what God said? Takes away from God's word right away. And then, you're not going to die you, he just doesn't want you to be like him. He just knows that if you eat from here, you're going to know right and wrong, and you're going to be like him. So he adds to God's word. Right away. It started right away. And it hasn't changed. When you can look at the creation account, and listen, I'm not talking about secular colleges. I'm talking about Christian universities. When you can look at the creation account and you can see in the day and the evening were one or the morning and the evening were one day and say, well, I really think that God meant time periods. That's really what he meant. A day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. He meant a thousand years. And some say, well, it just meant whole time periods, not even just a thousand years. It meant, could have been millions of years. It could have been. Maybe that's what he meant. Every place else in the Bible that that word is translated day means a 24-hour time period. Every place else. So what should our conclusion be? That he meant 24-hour time period every day except for where it doesn't suit us?
the whole point of God leaving his word here is there are many things that don't suit us. But because he loves us, he points those things out. Not to, not to just make us feel bad and get defeated. and We shouldn't be walking around dragging our shield of faith on the ground and our sword in the other hand dragging on the ground. The whole point of if you don't know something's wrong with you, how do you know it needs to be fixed? This is our, our weapon, the sword. This is builds up and makes us strong and able to be able to carry our faith. It makes our faith stronger. To know that he loved you enough to let you know this is what righteousness looks like. This is what evil looks like. And we have people that have a whole bunch of acronyms after their name saying, I'm educated, follow me. And, and Paul says, thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they left God. And they made images of God. With their own hands, they made images of God and worshipped him. And they made him to look like us, forgetting that he made us to be like him. These two, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were always at war with one another over these issues. But they have one binding issue, one that brings them together, and that is their hatred for Jesus. The one who came to challenge. The one who came to set the way straight. To say that the traditions of men are not what save you. That is not what makes you find favor with God. To say that you can know God. To bring the miraculous and set it right in front of them. To speak of angels, to, to acknowledge the prophets, to speak of them as, as they were true, they were right, they were real. And it's not just a challenge to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's a challenge to us. We, we look at stories and, and we're again told by highly educated people. That Jonah is just a story. That the things of Genesis are just stories, just to, just to help us. They're not true, they're not factual, and they're wrong. Because Jesus spoke of those as being true and having happened and real people. You cannot follow Jesus and discredit what he has given credit to. And some even take that and put it on the, on the disciples and the rest of the New Testament. It was all written by men, and I'm only I only go to the letters that are or the yeah the letters that are in red. Those are the only ones I pay attention to. And I have to pay attention to Paul and to Peter. Except that Jesus endorsed both of them. There are lead red lead letters, red letters that endorse Paul. There are red letters that endorse Peter. So if you're going to pay attention to the red letters, guess who else you better pay attention to? You can't cut this into pieces and just keep what you want and dismiss the rest. It is going to challenge. And there's going to be moments and places and parts and things that you, you look at in God's word. And it's going to be plain as day and it's going to hurt. But well, we looked at a woman from Canaan last week, and she came to him and she said, Lord, help me. And it says she worshipped him. And that's what she said for worship. Lord, help me. She came in complete submission to him. And didn't back off and shy away with when he said, I didn't come. It's not right to take that which belongs to the children and throw it down on the floor to the dogs. And she said, but I'll take the crumbs. Even the puppy gets the crumbs from the kids. 
in great faith, he said. Your faith, your faith is, is, is huge. What you want will happen. We have to. Those things that challenge us, those things that, that even hurt sometimes, those things that we, like David, we looked at Wednesday night, and they were transporting the ark and bringing it in, and everybody's happy, and there's this big celebration, but they put it on a cart. They're not bringing it the right way. They put it on a cart. They're dragging it in. It begins to tip, and Uzzah puts his hand out. No ill will toward God. Puts his hand out to steady it and dies. Because they weren't doing it according to the word of God. They were doing it according to their own way. It says it seemed right to the people. But nobody asked God. And Uzzah lost his life. This is not about popular opinion. And we're going to talk about that today. If we just ebb and flow with the popular opinion, we're going to be in trouble. Anyways, let's get into this. I think I've hit that hard enough. If I haven't, you can ask me questions later. So verse 1 says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked him, or asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And his answer, or he answered and said to them, when it, is, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to, how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it, or given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. Show us a sign, they said. The Pharisees have already tried this once. So I'm imagining that this is a Sadducee actually throwing the question out, the request out. Who doesn't believe in signs and wonders anyways? He doesn't believe in that stuff. He's dismissed it all. So to look at the healings that are happening and say, listen, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about these things, said the Messiah would do these things. That was the answer Jesus sent to John. The blind see, the, the dead are raised. You know, the whole, he went down the whole list to bring comfort to John who was in prison, who would not get out of prison but would die there. And these guys are saying, show us a sign. Show us a, sh uh, show us a sign from heaven. If you can't look back into the Old Testament, and that's why I kind of spent that time I did at the beginning. You can't look back to the Old Testament and see the signs that God gave and accept them. What will you accept now? An angel showing up. Instead of a man preaching, an angel showing up and preaching, that's going to happen in Revelation. An angel's going to be flying through the air, shouting the gospel out, and they still won't believe. The idea that we need to have signs and wonders happening all the time, that is a sign that what you're saying is true. If I stick to this, you know that what I'm saying is true. I don't have to have a miracle to follow me for you to know that what I'm saying is true or that God has endorsed me to say this. As long as I'm telling you straight from God's word, you don't have to worry about it. You can be Bereans. You can go into the, into the word of God and search every day to make sure that what you're being told is true. I'm not saying miracles don't happen. I believe they do. I understand that they happen more often in, in other countries, in, in third world countries where there's a lot of pagan worship, where there's already a lot of manifestation of the, 
of the devil and his in in his false signs and his false miracles and so when missionaries go they see the work of god go out ahead of them and go before them in the in the things that oppose the enemy that happens because god is going in there and in front of their face defeating their gods and they listen But think about this culture here, educated, pretty much civilized. They're having them happen in front of them however often Jesus has the time to do it. I mean, we see one instance after another. There could have been great times in between. But we're seeing people coming and bringing their, their lame and their sick and their, their crippled and 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 all, and they're possessed to him, and he's delivering them all sometimes, it says. It continues on in Acts with the apostles. And even with the deacons. But what happens when Jesus begins to teach? When hard things begin to be said to them, the challenging things for their life, they leave. I've said before, these great multitudes that were being healed and, and, and following Jesus on one day, the people who lined the streets and shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On Palm Sunday, many of them were the same people in front of Pilate, worked up into a mob mentality yelling, crucify him, crucify him. I've had people say to me, man, if they would just see a miracle, if they would go over here at this church where there's miracles happening all the time, then they would believe. No, they won't. They won't believe that's even happening. They can see it happen in front of their face, and they won't believe that it's actually happening. They'll believe that it's been faked. Their heart is so hard against God already. You look ahead, and we'll eventually get to the, to the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, and they both die, and they both go to Hades. And one side is a side of torment, and one side is a side of peace and called Abraham's bosom. And, and the, the rich man wants... Abraham to send Lazarus back because if they see one come back from the dead surely my brothers will believe and they won't be where I'm at and Abraham says even though one is raised from the dead they won't believe they have Moses and they have the prophets if they can't believe that they're not going to believe one being raised from the dead Paul warns that the Antichrist himself is going to come with all kinds of lying signs and wonders to deceive the people. If that's all we're looking for, you are. if that's all you're looking for, you're very likely to be able to be deceived by the greatest liar of all. And John would say in one of his epistles, the spirit of Antichrist is already here back then. There are already people operating with the same intention. False prophets. Jude warns of false prophets that would rise up. And with them would not just come false teaching, but false signs and wonders. If you need a show to get your attention, then you have the wrong intention. It's the same reason, remember, Jesus wouldn't go to Herod. And even when he appears for, to him, in front of him, after his arrest, refuses even to speak to him. When he, he wants to see a miracle, perform miracles for me, do, he wants him to perform. That's not how it works. There have been many people, and maybe you've even had somebody do this to you. If God's real, then 
Let me just strike me down right now. Oh, see, he didn't do it, so he's not real. Yeah, God's God's not subject to you. And, you know, if you've done that and he didn't strike you down, just take for granted that he just showed you a lot of grace. Because if he struck you down, you would see him as a judge and not as a savior. The fact that he wouldn't honor that kind of idiotic request shows that he loves you and you still have another chance. Jesus says to him very plainly, it's in the evening or when it's in the evening, if the, if the, if the sky is red, you know, the weather's fair. So say, we've all been taught that right from the time you were a kid, red sky at, at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors be, you know, take warning. We can tell the weather. We can look at the sky and tell the weather. But we can't look at the Bible and tell the condition of the time that we live in. They had all the scriptures right there for him, and they couldn't tell that the Messiah was standing in front of them. And you guys, there are a lot of pastors out there saying, Leave the prophets alone. They're too hard to understand. You don't need to be so much in prophecy. You see this warning right here? If you don't have the whole of God's word, you don't know what day and hour you do live in right now. If you're not comparing the condition of the world, the teachings of this world, the positioning of countries in this world, you have no idea what, what day and time you live in. Listen, I believe Jesus could come back at any moment for his church. At any moment. And you don't have to look at blood moons. They may or may not be Something that Joel has referenced that could be something, an even greater sign that's going to happen to the moon than what we see. So you don't have to look at that. You don't have to look at the natural disasters. You can dismiss that and say, we've always had earthquakes. We've always had fires. We've always had tsunamis. We've always had this stuff. You, and, and you can discount the fact that they grow in intensity and they're growing in, in frequency, but they are. In recorded history, they're growing in intensity and they're growing in, in frequency. And you say, well, that's because of global warming. We've warmed up like what, one degree in 30 years? Wow. We could warm up one degree today and that snow won't melt. But we warm up one degree in 30 years in the entire earth and, and now we have more storms and more earthquakes and whatever else give me a break the reality of it is what's happening on this earth the degeneration of our earth is because God cursed it when Adam fell like it or not the degeneration of our earth is because God has determined it to be so it's not because of any man made thing that we've done We've proven that we can clean up a mess. But we can't stop it from deteriorating. God has done that in the beginning. When Adam fell, God cursed the earth. It might be a hard thing to understand it here, but it is. So you can dismiss all that, though. The verses you can say are vague that refer to those things. But there are some verses that you cannot say are vague. And in my opinion, the specific verses about other things make what you think is vague very specific too. Because in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it talks about a, a conglomeration of nations that will come against Israel. In Russia, in Iran, in Turkey, lead the charge. 
and Russia and Iran and Turkey are fast friends. And Turkey and Russia have never, ever in our known history been friends for any reason or in any sense of the matter. Ever. And now they are. And if you look at what's going on over there, if you can find a news feed that'll tell you what's going on over there, Iran is in Lebanon. Turkey is in Syria. Russia is in Syria and Lebanon. Damascus is just about demolished. Isaiah 17. Get ready. If you can tell the weather by looking at the sky, you can look at the scripture and you can tell the time we live in. This is why our Sunday nights are our prophecy updates. I, I even get other pastors that kind of look at me like, why? Why? Because we need to know. We need to know. And he calls them hypocrites, actors. You're all pious looking. You're all you're all dressed up. You go to temple when you're supposed to go to temple. You pray when you're supposed to pray. You make a show of it all, you hypocrite. And again, the church is full of hypocrites. Isn't that usually the first argument that you hear when you ask somebody to come to church? Church is full of hypocrites. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. If your definition of a hypocrite is somebody who's trying to change but on certain days fails at it, then yeah. If your definition is somebody who acts like a Christian but never is outside of the church, that's really the hypocrite. It's not somebody who's struggling with something. It's somebody who intentionally lives a different life than what he puts on in church. When we can say the things that we say without the love of Jesus in our heart. I mean, the Pharisees knew the scriptures inside and out. They knew enough to use them to be able to question Jesus, but their intent was if evil and wicked. And anybody who wants to take on the traditions of men and say, you will conform to this or you don't get this is a wicked and evil man. And there are some who hang signs in their buildings and have all kinds of catchy names. And sometimes, sometimes they'll put the church on the end of it. But you don't have to change. There's no requirement of God in you in here. We don't require anything of you. We won't challenge you on your lifestyles, on the way you talk, on the things that you do. We won't do that. We're just going to love you. We're going to make you feel good. You come in here, you're going to feel good and make sure you leave feeling good. And they cash in on it because they know once they get back outside there, that feel good feeling is only going to last a little while. They'll be back on Sunday. If you can really make them feel good. If you can put on a good show and entertain them. You know, there's there's some pastor I read an article about wrote an elephant in on one Sunday morning. Jumped the stage on a motorcycle another Sunday. Shot himself out of a cannon over the congregation up to the stage. And even said in the article, all that was going through my mind as I'm going through the air is how am I going to top this next week? You're not getting a song and dance out of me. You don't you don't want that. It won't it won't be entertaining. I guarantee it. There are many, many people who are acting. But if you know God's word enough to be able to identify those people yourself.
Can you understand and know where you're at and what you're living in? The only way to know is to know God. The only way to understand is to understand his word. And he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. You put those two together. You just want what you desire and what you want. That's all you. That's all there is to it. Satisfy me. Satisfy my desires. Entertain me. Make me feel good. Make them look bad. Make sure your your hair is cut right. Your dress is the right length. Make sure your tattoos are covered up. Or make sure you don't have any tattoos before you even come in here because we're not going to deal with that. I think we kind of mentioned that last week. Give me a break. We don't push people away from God because of that. You know, maybe somebody has a, a tattoo the kids don't need to see. Cover it up. You know, for the sake of other people, cover it up. But we don't want, you don't come to church to have chains put on you. But also, you don't take advantage of your freedoms at the cost of other people either. And he says, the only sign you're getting is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Jesus, three days and three nights in the tomb. One comes out in much better condition than the other one. But, but but they still came out. And it was a sign to those that they went and talked to. It was a sign to those that they appeared to afterwards. Verse 5 says, Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have Taking no bread. We didn't get enough bread. Mark says they had one loaf. Now, again, you're just part of two different occasions. Two, two mass feedings with, you know, five little pieces of flat bread and a couple of fish each. And you fed thousands of people. And you think Jesus is upset with you because you have one loaf of bread, one little piece of bread among 12 guys. And you think that's what he's upset about because he can't just rip that thing to 12 pieces and feed you till you're full. You're, you're missing it. Verse 8 says, but Jesus being aware of it said to them, oh, you little faith. Why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Why do you think that's the reason I'm saying that? So do you not yet understand and remember the five loaves of, of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware of it. They have an appearance of religion, an appearance of a closeness or an understanding of God. But there's a false, a falseness of it. Some of what they say is based on Scripture, but their their interpretation of Scripture is wrong because. For one, it's not literal in some cases, and in other cases, you have to add to it to try to explain what God was saying. Don't, don't mess with other religions. The, the leaven of the false teachers... the falseness of their message. 
you need to know and you need to you need to be able to understand it or you need to be able to identify it but you don't need to skirt around it you need to dance with it you don't need to be a part of it a little leaven leavens the whole lump paul will tell us it permeates the whole loaf you can have a big old chunk of dough you put a little bit of yeast in there and it's going to run through that whole big thing of dough you can't get it back It just spreads. And we have to be aware of that. Watch out for it. Don't let it spread into you. Verse 12 says, Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. How do you know if it's false doctrine? If you know the truth, if you know God's word, and somebody starts spitting out a teaching, a doctrine that isn't true, you'll know. You don't have to go out and learn about all of them so that you know. You're going to spend more time reading books about false teachers and false doctrines and, and who to listen to and, or who not to listen to. Be in God's word, man, and when he comes up and it's in front of you, you'll know. You'll know. You, you can't know the weather if you don't look up. You can't tell if it's good or bad if, if, you, if you don't look up. You can't tell right and wrong about the teachings of the Bible unless you're in the Bible. And I'm telling you right now, you are following God. You are, you are uh, praying, communicating with God, asking every day, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, keep filling me with your Holy Spirit. You're going to have somebody say something to you someday that is going to sound right, but you're just going to know. That's not quite right. Why isn't that right? You don't have to go online and, and pick off all the guys that, that will, you know, tell you why that guy is not right. I mean, sometimes that's a help, but you get in more trouble following those guys than you did if you just took the guy's statement and put it in the Bible and compared it to God's word. Because I'll tell you right now, the false teachers don't like each other either. They don't. Verse 13 says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do they, uh, who do men say that I am? Let me read that again. Who do men say that I, the son of man am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for, the f for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he commanded him, commanded his disciples that they should uh, tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Two very important questions. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? What's the popular opinion, guys? What do, what do the people think that I am? Who do they think that I am? You're moving among the crowd while I'm doing the miracles. They're out there moving among the, the, the multitudes. What's the word? Are you guys paying attention? I'm not asking you guys specifically. Just, well, actually, yeah. Who do people say that Jesus is? Right? Prophet, good teacher.
brother of Satan. Created being just another man who was good. We have all that, don't we? We talk a lot about now in our country, it's very popular to say the consensus is this. The consensus is that. The consensus in our, in our polls is that the people want this law. The consensus among our polls is the people don't want this candidate in office. There was a lot of consensus that were wrong a year ago. Even in science, the consensus is this is what happened millions of years ago. But you're scientists, you're supposed to operate in facts and observe science, not guess at what you think makes you feel good might have happened. Well, we can't, exp it's just, you know, your consensus is wrong. Popular opinion about Jesus is wrong. We don't need to make Jesus popular. We don't need to change things to make him more acceptable to everybody else. Dress him up a little bit differently. But Peter's even going to try to do that in the next couple of verses. We'll see that, that what happens, the, the, a specific instance here, is what's happening in the church at, at times today. But let's let Peter off the hook for just a minute because right now he's doing good. Okay. So who do men say that I am? Some John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? There's the personal question to all of us. If you've been following the Lord for a while, you believe yourself to be a Christian, who do you say Jesus is? Can you say this, that what, what Peter said? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God? Can you discern between popular opinion and truth truth that isn't always so popular Peter saying you're the son of God and God the son there's two statements in there you're the Christ you are the you are God the Son, the Son of the Living God. You're the Son of God. You are the living. You are the God the Son, and you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, "Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you." But my Father who is in heaven. This isn't something that you come to on your own. Uh, understanding, the true understanding of who Jesus is, is not something you just come to on your own. The Holy Spirit reveals it to you. If you're truly a born-again believer, you remember the day you came to the realization he isn't just the Son of God, as in he is a man born and just attributed the Son of God, but that he is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He is God. And with that, we're able to believe and we're able to confess. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that 
uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You understand that? Your salvation starts here. You believe unto righteousness. Confession is unto salvation when what you believe in your heart has to come out of your mouth. And it's for the first time in your life, maybe it's something that doesn't defile you. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Christ. It's not his last name. It is Jesus Messiah. The Messiah, the Christ, the one sent by the Father to redeem the world. He said, I say to you also, I, or I also say to you, that you are Peter, Little Rock. You're Peter, you're the small rock. You're just, you're a rock, dude, but you're just, you're little. And I picture Peter and James and John as some pretty big dudes. I mean, they have they have spent their lives yanking in fishing nets, rowing boats and building things and whatever else. These are some big guys. I don't think that there's, you know, uh, for nothing that James and John were called the sons of thunder. His three, thro- three closest guys, the rock and the sons of thunder. Big dudes. And maybe maybe Peter being older is is bigger, rougher. We know he thinks he's brave because he's re- very willing to just speak. At times because he just doesn't, I got to say something. I just, I didn't know what else to say, so I just said, blah. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, you're a little rock. And on this rock, on this precipice, on this big boulder, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He didn't build it on Peter. It's the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord of all. That confession, that belief in our heart is what makes the church undefeatable. It's not Peter. If you think that right from that point, everybody thought Peter was going to be the guy, the number one, it's only a little while after this that James and John send their mommy in and say, grant to my sons that one will sit on your left hand and one will sit on your right hand. They don't think Peter's going to be the guy. They're kind of moving on his territory if that's what they think. And the other, tw- the rest of the 12 get in on it. They're all kind of vying for what position they're going to have in the kingdom of heaven on their way to Jerusalem for him to be crucified. They don't get it. They still have this picture of him overthrowing Rome and setting up the government and and they're the 12, man. They are the heads of state. They're going to be there. What position am I going to have? Good news for you. They have the same position we all have on our faces in front of him. He did not here put Peter over and above everything else. Peter does end up assuming a, a position of leadership among the 12 initially, but eventually they all go in different directions. Paul doesn't think so much of the pos- the supposed position of Peter because Paul confronts Peter when Peter's out of line on a principle that God had talked to him about at least three times, eating things that would, you know, defile him in the eyes of the Jews. So when the Jews were there, Peter ate with the Jews and only ate their stuff and wouldn't associate with the 
But when they were gone, then he was eating with the Gentiles and, you know, pork chops and whatever else. But when the Jews were there, we, we didn't do that. And Paul confronts him on that because it was sending a mixed signal to all the believers. No. Peter is a picture of all of us. Sometimes we have it dead on right. We are strong in our faith. We know with all of our might what we believe. We, we feel at that moment nobody could move us. And at other times, well, we get the next story. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples, in verse 21, began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. How quick do you fall? Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. It's the same guy. One day, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. God has revealed the truth to you. And you believe. The next day, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You're mindful of the things of men and not the things of God. Peter, you lost your mind. What's wrong with you? They're offended by what he says. I have to go. I have to suffer. I'm going to suffer at the hands of all the leadership of our people. And they're going to kill me. But on the third day, I'm coming back. They're so wound up about the first part of that, they miss on the third day, I'm coming back. They miss it. So much so that even after his death and his burial, they still are missing it. They're not waiting at the tomb on the third day, sitting there waiting for him to come out. They're all hiding. They're all in different places. Even the women that come to the tomb don't come to see him alive again. They come to take care of a dead body. A fallen hero. And instead what they find is that he's alive. And even after they come back and tell the disciples, oh, I can't believe that. There's no way I'm going to believe that. And he shows up. And even after the, le or the, the 10, see, I mean, Judas is not there. So you only have 10 in the room. And they go and they tell Thomas because he wasn't there. And Thomas says, man, unless I see it, I'm not going to believe it. I can't. It's like all that going through it. James, the brother of Jesus, who would become the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, who would write the book of James, didn't believe until he saw his risen brother. You probably say the same thing of Jude, written by his brother Judas. Didn't believe until they saw their risen brother. And even Peter, who here has it right, has the right confession. Once Jesus is dead, forget still about this the third day, on the third day. We see when we read that story that the Jewish leadership didn't forget about the third day. They said, man, post a guard because he said on the third day, he's coming back. They took the whole story. His disciples are like, oh, our world's falling apart. Now listen, I don't think when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, that he was calling Peter Satan either. I think we have this story back to back though right here so that we don't set Peter on too high of an elevation there. When Satan left at the temptation of Jesus, it says he left for a season. I think Jesus was tempted over and over again by Satan in any way he could possibly be tempted right into the garden.
Peter. You're mindful of the things of men. We don't want to talk about what Jesus talked about here, that he suffered, that he died. We don't want to talk about death anymore. There are churches that refuse to talk about the crucifixion because they don't want to talk about the blood. Many church hymnals have taken out all the songs that talk about the power of the blood. It's a bloody gospel. We don't want to talk about that. It's too gory. We, we don't need to know about that. Everything hangs on that. Peter didn't want to talk about it. Lord, this is, this is not going to win over popular opinion. You're not supposed to tell everybody. You know, it's not, not a good message. We're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to die. That's not a good message for Messiah. Messiah is supposed to go to Jerusalem and set up his kingdom and overthrow Rome, the world power. And true, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Just not the way they thought. When's that going to happen? That's going to happen after the tribulation. Read Revelation. Take it literally. It's going to happen after the tribulation. He's going to come. He's going to set up his kingdom and reign for a thousand years over the world. There's more to that story, but we don't have time to get into that part today. We're going to take communion in just a minute. I'm going to finish up this chapter so you guys can get ready for that. Worship team wants to come up. That's fine too. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires, that's a key word there, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Are you worried about losing your life? Does it consume us to be afraid that we're going to lose it all? Does our status, whatever authority we think we have, whatever security we think we have, is it so fragile that we're afraid we're going to lose it and it preoccupies us to the point that we can't do what God is calling us to do? Or are we willing to lose our life? Listen, we literally, I'm talking literally. We have brothers and sisters all over this world and even in our own country that lose their life for Jesus. Because of what they believe, they are the target. We are the target. They're losing their security. They're losing status. They're losing authority. Because it's all wrapped up in the concerns of men. Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? What he's called you to do, are you willing to take that up and follow him? Do you have a burden for the lost? Isn't that why he carried the cross up the hill? Why he let them put him on it? for the lost, for you, for me, to pay the price? Are you willing to give up everything that seems important to other people in order to share the gospel? Are you worried about looking foolish? Are you worried about the area he may send you to, what he might send you to do? where he might send you hear that a lot i know if i do this if i say whatever you want lord i'm going to africa i know it no probably not you probably go to the amazon 
no, 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 we don't want to do that. Right? Are we worried about what other people think more than we're worried about what honors God? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What profit is it here to be comfortable? To, and, and by comfortable, I'm not even just talking about financially comfortable. To be comfortable. To be able to walk into a room with ease, not worried about your faith offending anybody. What does it profit somebody to deny Jesus and lose your own soul? To be satisfied in your own desires and yet lose an eternity. And what can you give in exchange for your soul? What do you have? What do you have that's acceptable to God for your soul, for your salvation? If there was any other way, then Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. If there was any other way. If you and I could make ourselves so valuable to God that we could, at the, at the time of our death, hand it all over to him, say, there, and buy our way in, he didn't have to go. But that's not what happened. Our righteousness, the Bible tells us, is as filthy rags. Our heart is deceitful and wicked. Nobody can know it. And all we have to do is look at the rest of the world and see. Listen, if we do not have the righteousness of God, we don't get in. If we're not made righteous before him, and the only way for that to happen is for him to make us so, for him to declare us righteous. If we don't have that, we don't get in. If we don't accept his sacrifice for us on the cross, we don't get in. If you don't believe in him as the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, if you don't believe that about him, you don't get in. No, Jesus was a loving person. God's a loving God. He would never do that. Jesus said at what we call the Last Supper, I am the way. And it's very emphatic. I am the way. There is no other way. I am the truth. There is no other truth. And I am the life. And nobody, nobody comes to the Father unless they come through me. There is no other way. And people will be offended by that. Who do you think you are to say that you have the only way? I don't have the only way. I just know the only way. I've received that i believe that and i'm chasing after the only way i've accepted that and i don't tell you because i hate you i tell you because if you don't believe that you're lost jesus said that it's written here so that we can share it because you need to know they need to know there is a way to spend forever with God. And it is Jesus Christ and Him alone. Verse 27 
It says, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with angels, or with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. We may have to tear apart 28 next week. But there are some, there are three of those people, Peter, James, and John, who see Jesus glorified, standing with Moses and Elijah. There's something that that's a reference to that. That those are three that see him like he will be when he comes with his kingdom. Before they die. But here's the thing. If you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, this death does not mean necessarily death to you. But the next step into life unimaginable. With Jesus forever. We're going to take communion now. We're going to remember what we just talked about. Jesus asked, whenever you do this, remember me. That is his instruction. As often as you do it, it doesn't have to be once a month. It doesn't have to be once a year. In fact, I think probably likely the church, because it was part of a Passover meal originally, especially when it was all Jewish Probably only did communion once a year. Probably only remembered these words that one time a year, not once a month. And I don't want this to become a religious thing for you. To just do this once a month. We have to do it every first Sunday of the month. It does make people nervous when I forget. I've had people after church, uh, we didn't do communion today. Oh, no, we didn't. Uh, yeah, it was the first Sunday of the month. Yeah. Are we going to do it next month or next week? Like we got to make it up. Are we going to do it next week? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we'll just, you know, pick up where we normally do. It's odd because I don't like to forget it, but I've actually found some comfort in forgetting it in the last few years. Just in that it's it can't be a religious thing for you guys if I'm messing it up. If I'm forgetting the reality of it is you can do this every day if you want to. Every day you take a little bit of juice, take a little bit of, of matzah. Start your day remembering Jesus. Or end your evening, end your day remembering Jesus and what he did for you. You can remember it without doing this, but it's important. While we do our last song, I'm going to have you guys come up. We've got the trays over here. You can get your, your piece of matzah. You can get your little cup. And then wait, and we'll take it together. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, starting with verse 23, if you want to follow along. So let's pray, though, right quick. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for what you have done for us, that you have come and you've died for our sin. Lord, you paid the price, the price that we could not pay. Lord, that you you made the ultimate example of what it means to be self-sacrificing. Willing to give up and stand in the place of other people who couldn't stand for themselves. Lord, I thank you for the teaching that you've given us in, in that some things are hard, sometimes hard to understand, sometimes just hard to accept. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to do these things. We're able to understand. We're able to accept. We're able to follow you. Because you haven't left us alone.
Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being the reminder, for comforting us when we need comfort, for reminding us who we are and who we belong to, for giving us courage and assurance and the knowledge of your word and the understanding of your word. Now, Lord, I pray that as we would take communion today, that you will be a part of this, that you will be in our hearts, Lord, that nobody who does this would just be thinking of themselves or just going through motions, but, Lord, that they would believe. If there's anything between you and them, Lord, I pray that they would take a moment and get rid of that, that they would just hand over to you, that they would become completely submitted to you now remembering that you are their king. Lord, I pray that this moment would be sweet to you and honoring to you. In Jesus' name, amen.